<laughs> I think it's supposed to be op positions, which I read as optimal. Oh, oh, yeah. Operative? Optional. 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 What else can you think of with op? Hmm? Uh, okay, good, good afternoon or evening, all of you. Uh, I'll start this. Uh, First thing I have to say really is that we've been, we've done this in a, we've prepared this kind of in a very uh, serious manner. So we have not talked to each, other, to each other really about what we're going to say. So it's going to be quite authentic, everything you hear over here. And, um, and uh, at the same time, I think it's, it's going to be quite different because I'm going to be speaking about uh, one work in particular. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, nearly completed recently, a house, uh, and I think uh, because uh, uh, there's not uh, that much information about, available about uh, our work back in Spain over here, Des will speak about a bit more work uh, that we did back in Spain. So, so it's slightly different, but that also that will give you kind of a, a view of different ways of facing a critique and the type of thing uh, that uh, we think of when we see uh, some uh, pieces of work. Okay, okay look, so the project I'm going to be uh, talking about is a house in uh, Anglesey. So it's quite a, a uh, small scale project if you want. A, and I've uh, got the title, A Cadavre Esquisse uh, uh, at Anglesey, a house by Des Smith. I hope by the end of this short talk you'll understand uh, what I mean. Uh, by that. A, well, the house itself, it's not a, as I was saying, it's not a big project. Uh, I've only got this uh, shot of its building process. So it's a, a two story uh, uh, house, a fairly compact on its plan. So it's not this kind of huge Aussie houses that uh, extend in the landscape. So pretty tall in its proportions, it's pretty, it's pretty tall. Uh, but it's, it's uh, I would say, in, in terms of its, its overall parameters, there's nothing very singular about them. So it's quite a, a, a um, I would say, a normal kind of job you guys might get in a few years' time. In a few years' time. So in that sense, I think it's a good example for you because it's, it's showing you how a, a very experienced architect faces this kind of commission. So. To start with, I would I have to say I visited the uh, I saw the drawings from the house and I visited that place uh, twice, uh, uh, once in year 2013, but uh, normally December, more or less when that initial photo was taken. That this one here, and uh, and uh, a few weeks ago during our planning day, I think it was by the end of January, uh, beginning of uh, uh, February, when the uh, house was nearly completed. You'll see that with this, uh, things are always nearly completed, ne never uh, completed as such. It's quite difficult to say that. Uh, and it was, uh, for me, it was quite surprising in both occasions, but in particular in, in the uh, second one, uh, because uh, when I saw the house, and I hope you realize that now, uh, it was uh, unusual, and I wouldn't even say rare, uh, to have first somebody, an architect, trying to do so many things in such a small-scale project. Yeah? We are quite used now to see, when we see housing projects, houses by any artist, that they, they try to pick kind of one topic yeah? uh, or one issue, but perhaps house facing the sea yeah? or the ocean. Yeah? Uh, and you do a house all around that kind of idea, and everything in the project is designed to uh, address that initial idea. In, in this house in particular, it's not the case at all. Hmm? Now, there's lots of stuff happening over there. It seems like the architect is trying to uh, set an example for every single issue that deals with architecture. So that's in, unusual in one sense. And the second sense it's unusual about, it's extremely personal. Hmm? At the same time, in houses, it's very difficult to find uh, that much of the personality of an architect uh, expressed so clearly in a building. Hmm? So that made uh, every uh, interpretation of the uh, house difficult, I would say. Of course, I came, I come from a European background, uh, just arrived here, and uh, a first moment, even, even last year when I saw the drawings, 
uh, I made an initial judgment of it. Yeah? So, uh, and immediately, because he's got this two arches that you can see on the uh, uh, on the image here on uh, on the in the dining room, the main double story uh, space uh, of the house. Um, that immediately linked my, my memory to what was called postmodernism in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, perhaps. Uh, but very soon, uh, do, do you all know what the postmodern was, more or less? Yeah? You can reference where it sits. Uh, but surprisingly, so it was a kind of a tendency, a trend in the 1970s that kind of reused some elements from, uh, I would say, classical architecture in a free way, so to reinterpreting them to, to provide kind of certain traditional values that should be attached to architecture. Uh, they did that uh, in, from a theoretical point of view is a very, very important movement. From a more uh, professional, practical uh, point of view, it was not that successful, but, uh, but that's what my first impression immediately linked to. But uh, as I was saying, very soon I started noticing that the uh, it was not going to be as easy as that. Eh? Uh, it was not going to be uh, as easy to categorize that uh, project in that uh, particular uh, a current if you say, uh, tendency, because there were elements all over the place that uh, were quite disturbing. Eh? If I had to, uh, if I had to uh, use a word to uh, express my my sensations that, that afternoon or even I would say disturbing. I would say everything I found just confused me a bit more, a bit more. So when I saw the article, okay, that's what's more than fine, made up my mind, I've got a judgment made, that's it. But uh, you moved kind of two, three meters, you looked at another object there, and you saw something else that was not at all the same language. For instance, you see the arches from the outside, and they look like this. And this, I can tell you, is not at all a. a uh, a postmodern language, it's something else, it's something else happening there. Uh, so, immediately after accepting I was completely wrong uh, in my first appreciation, I started saying, I'm going through kind of all my, my uh, uh, knowledge or experience of what uh, uh, different tendencies, different currents I have been, and went through them trying to place that, uh, I wouldn't say strange house I was visiting in, in some of the categories. So, I thought about some first was, uh, that is very Australian, and he's taught me, and he continues teaching me lots about Australia, more kind of like, perhaps it's a kind of a vernacular huh? a kind of manifestation of how housing is over here. I could see some elements so that we can identify in Mokert and company, but uh, certainly uh, it was not the case, I think, of the building. A, some elements like those things on the windows might remind us of some deconstruction kind of. Uh, uh, approach to design, or uh, in, in certain moments the house becomes very playful in the use of color and the use of, of very kind of free and different use of, of actual elements and fundamentals. So I thought it might be pop. Wasn't uh, convinced about that also. Rational, completely rational. Uh, there's uh, lectures a lot on Le Corb, uh, so it might be I'm just confused, and this is really a rational approach to design, uh, but it's not so. But you can find elements of each one of those. Huh? Uh, so you can imagine, I'm pretty used to make judgments very quickly, uh, uh, and I wasn't able to, and that was making me quite annoyed. I have to say, so I kept moving around. This is these are some shots from that evening after planning day, having a glass of wine uh, in there. You can see Mark Luther and Miyana in. Uh, car there and then uh, staff members visiting the house and uh, the other thing that happened that afternoon that evening over there is that for some reason everybody's everybody uh, was extremely comfortable in that space in that house uh, and uh, I think the only one that was not very comfortable was, my, was myself uh, because I couldn't understand what was going on I couldn't I, I, I was even annoyed about about this other staff members being so comfortable in that space that I could not understand I, it was impossible for me to actually kind of place that piece of architecture in some of the pre-categories I had uh, uh, preconceived. So it was quite strange. Eh? Uh, and, uh, so I just want to show, I, I, I've put together three kind of uh, a 
sets of images all together to just show you the enormous amount of different details and, uh, and uh, elements that are in a house that is probably around 200 square meters, something like that, yeah? 200? 150, well, even smaller. So in that minimal space, the amount of things that happen over there. Of course, the first thing is windows. Windows all over the place. And, and I can tell you there are, no, there are no two windows that are the same. Every, every space has its own window, and it's different to the one next door. Everyone. So you've got the arches, of course, and you've got the main entrance. You've got the entrance to the, uh, through the kitchen. You've got the window for the uh, bedroom, or you've got the window for the, uh, for the toilet. And there's only a few of them here. And you had all these materials and colors and textures in there. In 150 meters, a house. Huh? Mm -hmm. Imagine, I was thinking of these houses, you know, white houses, the typical ones that you would call modern now, contemporary houses, pure white volumes with one big window looking at that, and that's about it. Uh, normally everything very white, very clean, eh? very aseptic. Well, in the house here, you've got, uh, of course, colors, reds, greens, and yellows. Uh, you've got uh, brick, you've got timber. You've got steel in very different configurations. You've got uh, everything, everything. Yeah? Uh, you walked into a, the next chamber, which with no doors, and, are, and the, all these spaces are in surprising continuity, one after the other, which, is, which was even more surprising. And you've got all these details also. These are only some parts of it where you have, uh, well, the brick outside, uh, which is a, amazing. You've got this normal fabric, but you've also this arch built uh, uh, extremely well. I have to say, in Spain, we are supposed to be experts in brick layering and uh, brick building, which is just because it's very cheap. It's not as expensive as it's over here. So we've got lots of, 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 of uh, work done in, in brick. And um, uh, it had been a long time since there had been a layering of brick as detailed as this one. Uh, and you've got this kind of, for instance, this tiny stair here, hmm? a stair that communicates two spaces in the in the main uh, living room, and they made some of them made of bricks, some made of concrete. You've got this details of uh, of the structure on the timber. You've got the entrance, more details of timber, for some beams. Uh, of course, the uh, kitchen that just breaks and comes outside and communicates inside and outside. So it was. I have to say, from my understanding, it was simply too much. I, I couldn't, I couldn't cope, couldn't cope. There was too many things happening, no way of placing this uh, anywhere. So I can remember there was kind of a very, a, a friendly conversation among staff who were sitting in that uh, uh, living room. I, I was quite silent because I, because I was kind of processing high speed, eh? using all my, all my memory, RAM and ROM and all the memories I had to try to place it somewhere, and I just couldn't make it. Eh? Uh, until we uh, just left, no, uh, I was uh, defeated completely. And when I was driving back to Melbourne, uh, I can kind of continue that way, uh, thinking about uh, a way to interpret this uh, uh, this house. And uh, I found it. I found it, and I was extremely happy. I ne nearly had an accident. Uh, was, I thought I, ha I had been thinking uh, uh, in the wrong way. I was I was trying to place. A, the project in a particular kind of current, uh, which is never, I have, to tell, I have to tell you, it's never a very good idea. I try to kind of categorize and simplify the work of anybody in a particular thing. It's better to try to understand uh, the way that uh, the architect has done that thing. And, um, and then, it'll, of course, you'll be related to one or other kind of way of doing it, of course. Huh? Then we've got families of people that do things similarly, but it, it's, it's that way. It's families that build styles, if you want, although I don't like that word. Not the other way around, not styles uh, uh, that are imposed to, to uh, architects. So I don't know if you know what this means, and this guy, this is Andre Breton, he's a, a writer and a poet uh, uh, from the uh, early 20th century. Uh, surrealist. He's named as the founder of the Surrealist movement, which is, um, they were quite crazy, these guys, and they were right, initially they were only writers, so then uh, there were some other ones, and they developed this method to create new stuff that was called 
le cadavre esquisse, which means uh, the exquisite corpse, literally. Um, I reckon you probably, when you have been kids, you have played a game that's called normally this way, which is kind of an international uh, kind of name already. It, it consists in you write a sentence of whatever, and you cover uh, all the words on that sentence apart from the last one, and you pass that paper to the next one, and somebody else, just knowing about that word, continues that sentence in a, in a way. And then he covers it again, and you continue. So that, that, that was a method that these guys invented, and they called it like this, the Clavus Kiss. Squeeze because the first verse that came out of that system was exactly that, the one you've got down there. Le cadavre squeeze boira le vin de beau. That means the, the exquisite corpse will drink the new wine in English. And that's the type of verse that came. That, so it was a, a method to create new stuff uh, uh, by sometimes not knowing what's uh, uh, right, completely the meaning of what's before it. Um, don't ask me why, but for some reason, when I was driving back to Melbourne, I thought of this guy and of this cadaver's uh, uh, kiss related to that house. Okay. Uh, here you have a few more examples of, of this. This derived into the something you might have heard about. It's automatic uh, writing. This is writing without thinking, writing, uh, putting down your all your notes about everything you can think about without uh, reflecting or trying to articulate it at all. There's some other methods derived from those. With some, the poets write beautiful words they thought uh, about on pieces of paper, then they throw, the, throw them up to the, to the, uh, uh, on the floor and just put them together uh, as they have fallen down. And uh, the method was also uh, practiced in, by painters and sculptors in, in that period. This is a drawing by, of course, all these cadaver uh, squeeze, uh, all these drawings are normally called uh, exquisite corpse, uh, was done by a a few painters, uh, Salvador Dali was one of them, but Breton was there. Was, they did the same thing with the drawing. You did a part of it, you folded it, you just uh, allowed the second drawer to, do, to see just a little part, and they had to continue drawing right next to it at a certain part and then pass it to the next one. So that generated this type of elements, that method of doing. And uh, I've got the feeling that uh, uh, this designs a bit like this. I think this house is done a bit like this. Uh, but he plays, of course, again with himself. Huh? He plays again with himself. So he, when he got this, I got the feeling with this house, uh, and I've seen this very many times, take notes of things and take notes of, of meetings, of ideas, or whatever we do. He takes notes in a very, very uh, uh, systematic way, but at the same time, uh, if you see any of his pages, apart from having a very beautiful handwriting, there's, it's very difficult to identify the structure in that, in that set of notes. So he's taking notes of everything that's happening. Because everything interesting. He's got interest in every, absolutely everything that happens. Uh, Large-scale things, small-scale stuff. Uh, at the same time, he knows a lot about architecture in all those different scales. Eh? So he knows certainly a lot about European architecture, but he knows even more, I would say, about uh, the Aussie approach. And, and all of those issues are equally important for him. And when he decides in this, in this house, all of that stuff is in the building. It's in the building, in the project, in some sense. And it's not, there's not one idea that's more important than the other ones. They are simply just one very skillfully, very skillfully, which is very difficult to do this, put one next to the other, juxtaposed. And that's where you get, uh, that was the explanation, the only explanation I could find to myself to make me to relax myself and say, okay, this is how he did it. And this is how he created. So it's kind of getting all that, all that, all that knowledge, all that, uh, 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 all those inputs huh? uh, together into one element. Of course, the difficult part of, of this process is how do you provide unity yeah? to the project when you do that, huh? and that's a difficult part. But uh, we'll speak about that in a minute. Uh, not yet. A, a I might, be, I might be able to do this. Because I think the only issue, in all those photos that I've seen, I saw there, and when I was here, the only thing that I could experience as a, as a constant across the board in, in all these design decisions that he had made is this kind of uh, appreciation of uh, architecture as a craft. Uh, as, as the art of putting together things, 
physically. And that's the aspect that really ties together the whole house, eh, in a sense, eh, uh, and allows uh, the house to be read as uh, one single project and not a, an exquisite corpse made of different parts. Mm. What happens with, uh, no, I won't show that one yet. What happens with this kind of procedure, and I'll tell you why I thought uh, that was a correct interpretation, is that the house and the space of the house has a certain, and I would say intentional, lack of hierarchy. So spaces are all the same eh? on paper and on space. And it's only you, by sitting in one place or the other, that activates your space or It's impossible to sit in two different spaces in that house, in that tiny dining room or living room that must be around, I don't know, 25, 30 meters big, that you get the same perception. And that's the reason why all those people that were sitting having that piece of wine over there, they all felt special. Hmm? Because they were all looking at different houses, if you want. They were looking at different parts of that house because it had not been conceived of, uh, as one single project. It had been conceived as very many different things right? in parts. So one, one guy was looking through the arches and got a perception. Another one was lying and just looking at the roof like I was. I, I took the picture of that X. And some other one. So, and, and I'm speaking of difference of uh, meters, centimeters in the position of the, of the person over there made a huge difference in the perception of the space. A, I know you guys, you haven't built a house yet, and you don't know how difficult this is. Uh, how difficult it is to, to, to uh, be able to design and build a space that really is, uh, doesn't have a spatial hierarchy inherited in it. But you are going to allow whoever is sitting there and the experience of that space to produce one sensation or another. It's, it's, it's extremely complicated, extremely complicated. At the same time, that, uh, that uh, space, and you can see it with this photo, uh, uh, I think the house is not yet being lived, eh? but you can get the sensation of how dense it is. I, saw, I said that from the beginning, it's, it's dense. Normally, when you see these houses that are published in journals, uh, new houses, they all, they've all got this kind of coldness inherited. Eh? It, they're kind of cold, they need a bit of life. We think they are, uh, we need people to be sitting there a, uh, to understand. Pe we need life to occur. Uh, by this process of the exquisite uh, corpse, I think uh, the design kind of compresses time. The time that a normal project will require to become lively, I would say, a normal house, that would normally require a few years until the person that lived there appropriate the space, they make it then. So you, when you read the space, you're not looking at a, a kind of an, a, an abstract equation of something, but you're looking at something that's really livable. Uh, by this very, very complex and sophisticated procedure, uh, it's achieved from the beginning. So the, the space is dense from, from the beginning. And um, uh, I'm about on time, yeah. Uh, as I was saying, well, the only thing what tied together uh, was the this uh, uh, I would say, I wouldn't say love for the craft, uh, and um, after knowing this, and then after a few well, I thought about this for a few days, and then I was lucky enough to I was supervising Luca, a student over here, one of your students, and uh, um, he's doing he's planning to do a thesis on on Mirais, and um, we had a few conversations about him and about his collapses, and the moment he said the name and he said, okay, I'm, I want to do this, I kind of made the second discovery I was looking for uh, around the house, and it was some other architect that did things in a similar way as this was proposing in this house. And I've, the closest example I can think of is the Spanish architect Enrique Mirais. Eh? Uh, with a completely different language, if you want, a different uh, uh, palette of materials. You know who I'm talking about? Well, Luca knows, certainly, but I suppose most of, most of you do also. Spanish, huge artist. If you haven't looked at him, uh, dead already, very early, he had bad life, two wives, and uh, other issues. Uh, and he died very early from a stroke, but he left us quite a few excellent projects. 
And those projects, when they appeared uh, in Spain and in all Europe, they created this same kind of disturbing situation where nobody knew really well where they were coming from. So some people placed him in, in uh, a, a uh, deconstruction, de deconstruction group. Some other people said he was a uh, rationalist. Some other people said he was a, um, a pop architect or even a vernacular, a lo local Catalan architect, uh, uh, kind of a, a disciple of Gaudi. A, I've always had the view that he had some relation with the surrealism and Dada. And with this method of creating kind of dreams and new universes of things. Um, and um, I have uh, made this uh, very, very quick. I made it last night, it's about two, so forgive me if it's not good enough. Uh, this kind of photo montage collage with three of the shots that the uh, uh, desk gave me from the house and finished, trying to uh, resemble a bit how, how uh, Mirais presented his work normally. He never took a shot of a of his houses complete so he was more about the fragments of things how things looked at partially and then the, he put them together so things uh, got together but the individuality of fragment was always always more important than the unity so he produced enormously enormously uh, rich spaces that uh, everything responded to the order to a certain order and you could identify it but it was uh, never simple. Hmm? So things were straight, but not completely straight. <laughs> so and the material was consistent, but it was there was something else going on. So the plan was over there, so it was a rectangle, but you had this wall that was slightly open. So you had these arches that look parallel, perhaps, but they're not. And you realize when you look closer, you realize there are two arches which are not parallel at all, and they create this space in between. So everything is nearly correct, nearly there, nearly organized but very subtly and very difficultly moved, so you allow different perceptions of, of that space in the moment you move around. And um, this is my view of that house, and uh, this is what I had to say. Uh, as I said, no, no conversation between this and myself, so it might be he says I'm absolutely wrong, uh, but I don't care. Uh, uh, I, it works for me as an explanation uh, and I think articulated in different ways and I hope it does to you guys uh, make a bit of sense and I would just like to finish with another uh, a, a, another painting uh, that I thought about during that visit to the uh, to the house which was uh, this uh, garden of earth, earthly delights it's one of my favorite uh, uh, paintings, uh, um, not because of its uh, thematic, but also it's, it's okay. But I have to say that that day over there, when looking out those windows, uh, those very different windows that I had around, them, although there was it was a it was a it was a building site still, so we had lots of crab around the house, so we couldn't really uh, establish that relation with uh, uh, the outdoors uh, in a very uh, let's say uh, proper way. A, I thought that universe, that this very complex design system that Des had used, uh, created exactly that. Created a, a a not a house, not a space, not a dining, not a double space, not, not something that was could be explained uh, in the terms that many a modern architecture is, but it created a whole world available for uh, the inhabitants of that house and. Um, visitors as we were on that day and um, that's it I think yeah good I'm done Okay, I don't know who's the biggest fruitcake, me or Diego. Uh, I'm not, I won't make any comment because I'm interested in that commentary from you folks. But uh, I've 
I've been asked to talk about Diego's work and uh, I have not had the privilege of visiting any of his projects so my discussion is completely different to Diego's both experientially, factually, architecturally. So I have a different set of criteria that I set for myself and I have a completely different set of information that I can use. I was given by Diego, um, I did search the interweb to try and find out as much as I could about particularly his, the work from his practice uh, and then Diego gave me a couple of PowerPoints that he had presented which contain, I'm assuming from his inclusion of them, the works he's most proud of or thinks carry the most discussive weight because they were put in presentations, they weren't, uh, they weren't marketing agendas. Uh, and then I also found out a little bit about his PhD because he's a, a doctor. Um, so he's done a PhD, which is a lot of work. And I assume someone as determined as Diego will choose a topic that he thinks he can at least maintain some energy with for five years. Yeah, five years, which is a long time. Uh, particularly if you're busy and you do lots of other things because you have lots of other very interesting bits of information coming at you which want to deflect you all the time. So to decide to do a PhD in a particular field concerning, in fact, two characters, not Des and Diego, but um, the two characters that he did write about, that was going to give me more insight then, but it was in Spanish. My Spanish is not as good as it used to be. Um, so then I had a small proce, I think, which was a response to it or an address from it in English. Is that right? Is that what that subsequent piece was? Yeah. So I've put all those together. And with that, I'm going to make some suggestions about the nature of the work, the nature of Diego as a, an architect. And of course, because I can't avoid it, let alone resist it, um, I guess I'm going to attempt to frame it in a way where you can see the way we might deal with a colleague's work in the same manner that when you pin your work up on the wall, we deal with it and we make commentary on it. He and I are dealing with work which is, I mean, we've both been practicing for quite some time, maybe a bit longer than Diego, simply because I'm older than him. Uh, so we're both working at a fairly high level. So I'm prepared to read into it quite intently. Um, I may get it wrong in terms of what Diego thinks, but uh, that's what I've been asked to do, so that's what I'm going to put forward. This is this image is the cover from, I think it's the cover from his PhD, is that correct? Yeah. And the two characters in it are Claude Parent, who is the, the one called Des, and Paul Virilio is the Diego character, one's a philosopher, one's an architect. They're the two characters he wrote about, and the name or the title is uh, basically the function oblique. Is it function? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So just so you know about Diego, because as an, as he would say, Aussie, <laughs> you have to calm it down a little. Because uh, I'm Australian, I, I have a very particular attitude. And architecturally, for me, it's interesting particularly to think about European architecture, because most of our, in Australia, most of the architectural heritage is European, or European derived anyway. So the first thing is, yes, Diego is Spanish, so you have to dial that in, okay? He comes from a European background, so there's a completely different way of relating to the world, because most of the world in Europe is made of people, whereas in Australia, most of the world we have here is made by bits of nature. That changes it dramatically. Um, <coughs> His father was also a very well-known architect and critic in Spain. Uh, so I think Diego has by far the most extensive architectural heritage of certainly any of the staff members of the school, and I don't know any other staff members of this school previously who would have the architectural heritage that comes with him. And as an architect, that influences you. Okay? Most of you are probably the first up grant architects like I am, but when you come out of architectural heritage, it changes the way you deal with it. My uh, ex-wife, she comes from five generations of architects, so it just changes the way 
you see the world. So I'm asking you to then dial this in. And of course I'm saying these things to you because you add up, this is my attitude, you add up all the information you can and you try to see what the mix is pumping out. You don't try to second guess the outcome. You gather as much as you can and you see what it rolls around, knowing full well that you gather it in a certain format. So I always try to double test my format by mixing it up, but I know that I carry it in a certain manner. So his father was a well-known architect and critic. Diego practiced uh, certainly in Spain for about 20 years, um, and for a fair portion of that, his, his sister, who was also an architect, uh, they practiced together, but the, the practice was larger than the two of them. I believe they did about 90 projects, so that's, that's quite a lot. I think that's 90 completed. 75 completed. Uh, architecturally, that's a lot. Corb, Corb built 65. Some of them are really good. <laughs> but he still only did 65. Uncle Frank did 300. So 75 is a lot. Graham Gunn's done 1,000. Uh, so you have, for me, I dial that up. I think about what that means. He's run a couple of architectural journals and he's written many articles. Is that right? You run, you run some architectural journals? Yeah. So he's interested in architectural critique. He's interested in knowing about architecture. He's interested in having architecture dealt with. So with all those things, I should be able to get some of that or see that feeds into the work in some manner. He also had a research project called Architectural Zombies, which I think is dealing with the fact that Spain produced an enormous, well not enormous, a lot of buildings during their unsustainable economic growth. They produced a lot of buildings that were never occupied or never occupied completely. So I think that's why he's calling them zombies. Yeah? Because they never had the proper life, even though they were completed. It's kind of strange. Um, then he did a PhD on these two characters, Paul Virilio and Claude Parent. One's a philosopher, the guy called Diego, and the other one is an architect, a French architect. I think they're both French. I think they're both French, yeah? I've read a bit of Virilio. He's a bit of a postmodern wanker, but that's okay. Because um, postmodern, postmodern is incredibly, very important. Uh, and I was encouraged that, for me, that Diego mentioned it because postmodernism was very influential because it was hot to trot when I was about your age and a bit older. So those things are very influential, but you need to understand them. Uh, Claude Parent, I'd never heard of before. Um, I think I say Parent, he's a French architect. And I know that Diego has one of his drawings, I think still pinned up in his office. Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so with, with this bit, I think he was I think he was studying the nature and the opportunity and the difference of oblique. <laughs> he's, look, he's looking for some kind of space to move into where you get a little bit of freedom. Particularly if it's different, it gives you that freedom. Yeah? Because when you, for, for me, I'll make this correspondence. <laughs> uh, all right, here's a little anecdote which might help. When Diego nearly first landed here, he was kind of struck by the openness. Some would say emptiness. You could say freedom or carefreeness of Australia, particularly architecturally. And he asked me a couple of questions about why did people do this, why did they do that, in a very European inquiring manner. And my response was, because we can. <laughs> Because we can. There's just enough room to do it. In fact, there's plenty of room. So you can do it. Um, and I think here, as a European, Diego is, as a creative person, he's trying to find the space to move into because that's, that's a lot of what heavy culture requires you to do. You have to find a spot in it that you can operate or else you follow, which is also fine. Just following gets a little tedious after a while, and if you want to have something to say, then you need a space to say it in. I'm lucky here, because there's a shitload of space to say it in. There's just literally a lot of space to say it in. There's always a lot of things to do, so I hope that's making sense. And the, this oblique was both directional, planar, spatial, and subsequently formal. Because if he wants to deal with this, even if it's Virilio, who's a philosopher, 
he's an architect. So he's looking for an architectural possibility in this way of thinking. So I just write down here, the oblique offered up directional, planar, spatial, and subsequently formal. Again, I'm not sure of the outcome, but I assume it's the spatial, it's the spatial nature or format that he is drawn to. And to some degree, this must be influential in his work, or at least it was in the work beforehand. Because most of us, if you want to undertake five years worth of stuff, it's going to be underwriting where you came from in the first place. And the, the PhD is probably the space for you to expand on that. <coughs> so that's me thinking about the yoga. And then, how do I go forward? Does it just do this? Yeah. Oh, I just put this in just, you know, because I can. Uh, I, I started the first one and then I got the second slide and I thought oh, I'll just put that in. How do you say bugger in Spanish? Anybody know? Sorry? No, oh, good. Okay, well, you can type that in then. Okay, good. Um, he then also, in his um, dissertation, he said there was a double tension involved. There was an interest in the function oblique as well as the creative principle as a philosophic problem. The creative principle as a philosophic problem, which I think is the Virilio bit and the um, function oblique thing is the parent bit, really as the philosopher, parent is the, the architect. I suggest that part of Diego's architectural output is work between the processes and the influences of philosophy and politics and production and politics. And the reason why I brought politics into it is that in Spain, like most of Europe, but particularly in Spain, it's, I imagine it's difficult to operate without being political because politics is incredibly influential. <clears throat> and I'm probably on dangerous territory and I'm happy to be corrected by Diego and probably Vera at the end if that's true. But I'm, I've, the reason why politics is in both of them is because politics is shared as it's a territory, I understand, that you can't escape in Spain probably particularly in Europe. But he doesn't want the work to be shackled by these non-architectural and petty operations and operatives. The problem for Diego as an architect to operate honestly in the political system is that you either buy into the system right, and therefore get controlled by it, or you want to stand outside it and then it's difficult to work. Diego, I happen to know, because I know more about Diego than I know about his work. So, and of course I'm saying these things not to uncover Diego, just to say this is how you need to think about things, how, whatever way you have into it. So I know that Diego is kind of, kind of apolitical. So to be apolitical in Spain is difficult. And if you're doing architecture that is inherently part of a political system because most of the work, they're public buildings. So he deals in the public. But he doesn't want, he's an architect, he comes from architectural heritage. So he doesn't want the work to, as I just said then, to be shackled by these non-architectural, because politics is non-architectural, petty operatives and operations, the operatives being the politicians and the operations being what they want you to do. Yeah. <clears throat> his architectural ideals, which are certainly instigated and stroke embedded in his family situation, are of a much more fundamental human concern, because his, his heritage is, at least the immediate one, is architecture. And architecture is a much larger ideal than simply the shackles of politics in Spain. So I'm trying to dial this into looking at the work. And then, of course, with my favourite phrases, saying, asking, yeah, but why does it look like that? Why does it look like that? Huh? <coughs> okay, then I've said here, the issue with the work, and I'm being tough now, so I hope it's not too tough. I think if I were to look at the work, and I haven't visited it, so I'm working completely from images, and they're not great res, but I'm doing my best. I think the potential richness of the work is thwarted by a kind of disdain, stroke conflict, with the politics of the situation. 
So if, you, if you're not fully into the situation, then there's a kind of withdrawal from taking control of the situation, because that's much more difficult. An architect that I would, I would suggest did that, and was probably harmed by it to some degree, is Luca Busier, who, who would move around with the politics, but always have some super answer at a cultural level, which would redirect the possibilities of working in whatever culture he was with, be it India, America, France, Germany. Yeah. So he moves around a lot more, and but Corb has very powerful architectural statements to make. I look at Diego's work and I'm, I'm seeing an architect who's making very refined, very polished, very convincing gestures in the architecture. And I'm, just, I'm looking at the work going, but I, I think it wants, it wants to have more commitment. I think it wants more meaning. Yeah? My work may be branded as being maybe over meaningful and therefore slightly crazy. And I'm happy to take up that discussion. But I'm looking at Diego's work, trying to understand not what I would do in that situation, but what is the work looking like? How is it appearing like this? <coughs> The work want to, wants to expand, but it's thwarted by Spain's latter-day love affair with modernism. I would suggest to you, and here, um, Diego, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but in Australia, certainly with some of my colleagues, we have discussed particularly Spanish architecture, particularly from the 80s forward, when El Croqui and all those um, magazines became very presentful, those uh, journals. Spain, used, Spain had this enormous period of doing fantastic modernist work, except to some degree from outside you look at it and go, yeah, but modernism was finishing. Like, why, why is it happening now in Spain? So brilliantly, with new techniques and technologies, which is what Diego's work is. Um, and I suggest to you, it's because Franco, the dictator from 36 to 70, three, or whatever it was, stopped all that. <laughs> There's a big bit of architectural culture missing. So when the shackles come off and Franco dies and the politics is rejuvenated, architects and probably other aspects of culture then pick up where they left off. Um, and Sp Spanish architecture in the period that Diego's working has this fantastic late modernism. Um, but it's kind, of, it's kind of slightly out of temporal sequence. But the work is incredibly proficient uh, and great architectural work, but it's slightly out of synchronicity with the world. Yeah? If we want another example, Greece, because I have a Greek friend who said exactly the same thing happened to Greece, except they missed the Renaissance. <laughs> and they missed the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And then in the 20th century, they played huge catch up. Yeah, you got slightly confused on the way. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm trying to suggest that I'm looking at Diego's work, thinking about what's it trying to say? Why, where is it getting these images and messages from? Why is it so polished and yet slightly cold, slightly lacking the next level of engagement? Of course, you now know that I see that because my work at least through Diego's eyes, is over-engaged. Yeah? So you can see my prejudice playing out in the images anyway. Yeah? <clears throat> well, that was, a, that was a sports stadium in Madrid. I forget the name of the, the suburb. And I called it a stadium, but it's the, it's the uh, grandstand for a soccer field. And this is the tennis pavilion in the same suburb, also in Madrid. Um, very fine, polished piece of work. I don't, I don't have any more images than this of it. Yeah, um, and I'm trying to understand what it's telling me about the nature of Spain, the nature of tennis, where the gestures, where the gestures come from, uh, and where the imagery comes from. I'm not going to go through those tonight, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm loading up a sense of how you might look at the work and what you might see in it. Then there's, I think this work comes about the same time as the PhD, I think. 
I'll write in saying that. And this is some work by Claude Perent. Uh, this is one of his houses, which deals with, as you can tell, the oblique, as offering up this other kind of space. And I think this is sort of indicative of what Diego's work is trying to find. It's trying to find this space of what here is called the oblique. <coughs> Oh, there's the double tension. This investigation, this is from the PhD um, explication, is under a double tension modified by two different aspirations. One of them tries to explain an interest in the function of leak, and the other one deals with the creative principles as a philosophical problem. I'm still challenged by what creative principles as a philosophical problem means. Um, as an Aussie, I have to take problem off the sentence because I don't think it's a problem. I'm prepared to call it, be a hippie and call it a challenge, um, but I don't see it negatively loaded, which is also a characteristic of certainly me, but I think it also changes the way we, certainly as inbred Aussies, see the possibilities of things. <clears throat> I was interested in this little sketch, um, or annotation, which I assume is Diego's handwriting, or is this from one of the others? This really is, okay. Um, and you can see where this is quite, a, for us architects, it's quite an architectural thing to suggest that vertical and horizontal equals plus, but two diagonals, two obliques as he calls them, equals multiplication. And you all know that multiplication is much more expansive than simply additive. Yeah? I'm just not convinced that the work, just by using the symbol, that the work does that. It's not more expansive. It's just a different modus operandi. My issue with, and I don't mind saying this bit about uh, this work, and I just, because I can't help it, I have to send it back out to you. The problem with suggesting that a new way of looking is completely new and very expansive is that it has to do all the work itself. <laughs> it has to be Jesus Christ and Buddha at the same time. It has to have answers for everything because it comes self-contained. Uh, so the oblique, whilst it seems like new, it then has to take up all the challenges that rectilinearity or is already sorted out. It has to try to answer them. So the oblique, whilst looking like a space with lots of potential, is actually quite limited by the fact that it has to do so much work. It has to have all the answers that rectilinearity has proffered and then have a, an alternative to them. It's just too much to do. So they end up being limiting. If many of you don't understand that, that's okay. I'm happy to spend another three hours trying to explain that for you. <coughs> See, this is, this is it. The product of this brutal collision was a new chemical element. More solid, more stable, more independent, but asked itself to do way, way too much. That's, I'm just sending that back out to you in terms of the oblique. <coughs> So here's some more of Diego's work, or work from the office, I should say, because even for me, the house was done with Scott, largely. Um, and so it is the work of maybe driven by one person, but there's always more involved. And I don't know how many people are in Diego's office, but quite a few, yeah. So it is work of a collective. This is an administrative services building, I think. Let's draw this. So I did my homework. This is a this is the headquarters for social 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 security, uh, and it was the first prize-winning entry in a competition. And I've been looking at these, going, I think it was built, yeah, yeah, yeah it was built, okay. Because I kept looking at the images, going, are they really good renders, or was it actually built? Because I didn't have high-res images of it. <clears throat> then this is another. First prize winning competition for competition entry for a hybrid building, which is in Huelva. Is that how I say that? Oh, yeah. um, and I don't know any more about it than this, but I'm putting, I'm, I'm showing you the work so that you can also see the work of someone who teaches here and you can start to sift through. So, what does that tell me about the way Diego thinks so that you can? use that when he talks to you in studio. 
not do what he wants to do, no, that's not what I'm suggesting at all, but you have the opportunity to then look at the kind of gestures that he would back, yeah, because they come out of the office. <coughs> this is, uh, I think, another headquarters building for the disability assessment and evaluation team, and I think it's also in, <coughs> in the south of Spain. Is this Malaga? Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, and th so this is, I think, sort of office, office administrative building, yeah? And again, you can see there's a kind of, there, there's this Spanish use of modernism in a very particular, very strict, it's not strict as in cold, but it's very strict and, you know, it's very measured, it's very uh, carefully ar architectural. And for me, the events are much more about composition. You compose things, yeah. So that's this modernist thing that I'm suggesting before. <coughs> This is a desalination plant, I believe, I think also in Malaga. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, which I think is quite, quite a big building. Um, and I'm suggesting that I, from my understanding, it's one of the buildings that Diego has more time for in their repertoire of work from the office. Is that correct? Yeah. The other one? The one with Oh, the one with bugger. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. All right. So again, there's this modernist language. I don't because I don't know any more about it than this one. It's in a plan, um, attempting to frame it in a way where, I, where, as I said before, I think the work is searching for a meaning. But the meaning, the problem with the search for meaning is that it's pushing up against the politics that it doesn't want to buy into. It doesn't necessarily want to have something to say about. It. Yeah. Oh, this is the one you like most. Yeah, this is the sewage treatment work. Okay, which I think is quite a big, quite a big structure. Yeah. Okay. Having known that, I'm now having to think very fast to go. What? So why does Diego like? Why does he think this one has more to offer than the one that I thought was the most appreciated in the office? But I don't have a response that quickly. So um, <coughs> we might be nearly out. Of, oh no! This is a police station. Yeah. Local police station again. Very refined, very polished. It's very well composed. It's very well screwed together. It's another thing about Spanish architecture, that, which we loved in Australia, was that so many of these buildings looked like they were incredibly well screwed together, which compared to a lot of work which was done in that time frame, that was not the case. So in Australia, we did admire Spanish work because of this. And in Australia, we do have a tradition of interest in the craft and detail. And Diego is certainly not wrong in that. Uh, so there was this, for us, a cross interest in Spanish architecture and I think Diego's work, particularly ones like this one and the previous ones, illustrate that commitment to how, they, how you build. But this one is the most interesting one for me because it's it just looking at, and I'm, just, I'm doing what I do when you guys been working on the wall, I'm just looking at the work, going, this one looks like it's got there's more life to it, there's more engagement, there's more, it seems more meaningful. Yes, it's a church, and I believe it's a high school church. Uh, I believe it's the church that Diego's family attends, am I right in saying that? Uh, no, no, I don't know it's uh, my high school It's your high school church, okay. But it is a building that he personally knows. And at this point, and it seems that this project, and the bit that they did was the timber work largely and the lighting. I think that's what I understand it to be, yeah? But those insertions have really redressed, if I'm looking at the space under it, changed it quite dramatically. And I just suggest to you that one of the reasons why this one looks the most engaged for me and probably richer, both spatially, materially, even formally, is because this one, being a church and it, it's from his personal background, it doesn't have to engage with the politics. It doesn't have to do that. The ground is already set by the milieu of the building itself. So in this building, Diego and the office can be the architects of the more pure architectural expression that they want to be, because it's freer, if you like. 
that makes any sense. Right? <coughs> it's the richest one to me. Uh, so I'm trying to explain why I think that one, as opposed to that one, what's, what's the difference in the works here? Yeah? <coughs> and yes, I love timber, blah, 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 blah. I like materials. This one's materially richer. So I, I have a kind of automatic attachment to it. But I'm still trying to say to you, I'm trying to explain how this thing works, particularly in comparison to the others. And that's it. <laughs>